Hello everyone and welcome to Phoenix Gaming. I am your host Nick Henning and we are here today for part three of four of my maybe poorly advised uh, solo four-handed experience playing these, 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 these four classes, Banner, Spear, Death Walker, uh, Rocks or shards or whatever you want to call that bottom one and drill which i think is pretty undisputed we're going to talk about drill today this is a spoiler uh warning for you and without any further ado we're going to go ahead and dive into it unlocking this class is perhaps the weirdest thing so let's start by talking about that it is the one class in this game that i think you unlock sort of via the puzzle book but maybe based on information that you knew in the past or maybe you cheated or maybe you got to the end of the game there's some weird ways to unlock this class and it does depend a lot on sort of your previous haven experience for how likely it is that you're going to get to the answer which personally i find very frustrating um if you've watched some of my other videos on the puzzle book you know that i'm not the hugest fan of the puzzle book um i still will probably get back to doing the rest of those puzzles someday uh but this class is a very cool class, and so I'm a, I'm a little bit bummed that it is kind of gated in behind um, this, this puzzle system because there's something very unique about the way this sort of like bruiser armor type class, mostly it's a melee class um, that does, you know, punching and defendy sort of things. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at that character sheet. I'm a Euro gamer. You probably know this about me, and so there's not anything that catches my eye more in a Gloomhaven game than a little track on the left. This isn't like some of our other spoiler classes where we have kind of collecting tracks. This is actually just kind of a changing uh, track over time. So the Metal Mosaic's, you know, kind of primary robo gimmick is that he is full steampunk. Um, basically, as you are doing certain things, your pressure will go higher or your pressure will go lower and your abilities are different. In function, what this means is that when you have very high pressure, you punch people for more damage, but usually you get a little bit of a consequence. You taking damage as well as a common one um, and then you blow off some steam by doing that. Conversely, if you are on very low pressure, it's easier for you to heal or do other kinds of um, sort of like maybe a few like debilitating effects along the way, um, but then you generally get more um, pressure from doing that along the way. Um, obviously, this goes on here to say that self-damage effects are not optional. They are, you know, you hurting yourself. This is a big melee class with those, you know, 10, 12, 14 hit points and everything like that, but pretty limited only at nine cards, which is not very common across many of the Frosthaven classes. So you're going to have to be pretty cautious when you're playing this class in how you are managing your hand size, which if you know me is one of my favorite parts about this game. So that did not deter me, uh, but they are not shy about explaining what it is that this class is melee and defense this is a run around and punch robot with a couple other abilities but eh, not really not so much we use fire and sorry about the green screen um ice along the way ice is a nice one in frost haven there are probably just a few more enemies that use that than the others um, but fire you're not going to see a lot you're going to be responsible for generating a lot of that fire along the way they've rated this as a complexity four which i think depends a lot on the build that you choose with this class there are kind of a couple different ways that you can play it i think that you could play this class as more or less a straight up melee bruiser and not have too hard of a time with it i also think that that underplays some of the greater strengths of this class as a personal preference, I thought this class was a lot of fun to play. I built it, you're going to see as we go through the cards, a little bit more on the um, the defense and retaliation build. I love a retaliation build in just about any game. So I uh, seeing some of the cards here, I definitely took the opportunity to go and do exactly that. So we're going to be talking probably more about the weird build uh, <laughs> than kind of what I think the base build for this character class would be. But I think either of them are going to be pretty fine. It can pack quite a wall up. It's a fun little management game between going up and down uh, on your steam pressure gauge. We're going to start off with a few of the kind of basic punch you cards. So pressure build up here is a two damage or four damage if you've got the um, ice to, to use along with it. And it generates additional um, steam or pressure. I'm going to switch between calling it those two things. Uh, moves you up that pressure track. Uh, and you're going to spend a lot of time, you're going to see that anytime you're sort of at the lowest level or the highest level, it's quite common that 
Um, the cards that care about those effects are going to push you back towards the middle. So you're going to spend the majority of your time sort of in the middle and then kind of pushing towards the extremes to get those payoffs. Um, here, this is a card that just kind of slowly moves one way or another. I would say that this is the most basic card of this entire kit. Uh, because it basically punches and then like maybe moves you up on that track the bottom of this moves and then you know maybe moves you up on that track and if you're going uh have a really really slow pressure you can drop a shield i played a build that really cared about having high pressure and maintaining high pressure so i never used the bottom of this card i think this card is totally fine it is as about as solid a role player as you can get um it's not going to last for long because it doesn't do anything terribly impressive along the way it's just a card that does basic card things basic melee people things as well Rocket Boots, on the other hand, is a little bit more interesting. The top of this card is a normal attack that pushes people. That's as good as you care about traps and hazards and scenarios and things like that. It makes a fire, which is nice for you. You're the one who's primarily going to be using it, but, you know, that's not a big deal. The thing that's exciting about Rocket Boots is it has a decent initiative, but really at the bottom here, if you are at maximum pressure, you can do a move six jump non-loss card um, to get you basically wherever you want to be in the scenario uh, in the room at that given time it's a pretty huge move for a melee class they listed this as like a medium mobility character i think rocket boots is probably the majority of the reason that it's like that way it's not always easy to be sitting at high pressure um, on your turn uh, pressure buildup actually in a lot of ways can be paired with this card if you're sort of in that you know level three pressure push you up to level four pressure and then you go you know spraying to wherever you want to head in the room but even just as a move three or move four rocket boots is another solid card i ended up taking this with me into a lot more scenarios because pushing is pretty good in frost haven as it turns out these next group of cards are kind of the like pressure payoff cards i would say um that that most caught my eye at level one a lot of cards pay you off for pressure but these are the ones that i think really kind of mattered the most steel pistons top is actually the ability that first caught my eye with this class an attack three that on a future attack ability essentially does plus two attack means that this is functionally a slow attack five which i thought was going to be very very amazing and turns out it is less amazing than i thought being a nine card class, the amount of times that you're going to set up just a kind of piddly attack three, and then, you know, you have to do that early enough in the cycle that your then subsequent attacks are going to be coming afterwards, ended up being a little bit more disappointing than I thought. Um, that's not to say that this card is bad. It's totally, it is totally respectable, um, but I, I would treat this card more mentally like a base attack four, which is, again, totally solid, but nothing to necessarily write home about. Um, at the bottom here, if you are moving at fast speeds, uh, sorry, if you're moving at fast speeds, if you have high pressure, then you can do a move and a melee attack. Um, I actually think in a lot of ways, the yellow ability stat line, this one right here, is the best that you can kind of plan for on this. If you're at that top um, pressure, generally, I want to be doing something a little bit more impactful than an attack three and one damage to myself before I go all the way back down to, to the... Um, the green level there there are some of the um masteries that do care about bouncing around with your your pressure so maybe that's a thing that you're you're considering with this card but i think in in general value generation you're going to be happiest if you have this card as a move to attack to at the bottom there that bounces you from that yellow down to your to that green area and doesn't cost you any of your life um i think that's the best that steel piston is generally going to be uh but again i as i was like leveling up my characters this was a card that ended up making a uh, not making the cut more of the time than i expected and i, I thought it was a card that i was going to be taking with me for quite a long time b max on the other hand is a card that i think uh does a great job i played this like you know you might have heard me say earlier solo four-handed um so that means that there were generally lots of monsters in scenarios and so the opportunity to attack two or three people with an attack four yes i punch myself for a point of damage but you can just generate a lot of pain with this in the right situations and worst case scenario the bottom of it is just straight up a move four that has the potential of doing some goofy stuff if you are at high or low pressure i actually i can't even say that i ever triggered the bottom ability with the low or high pressure i think it was just kind of a normal move four but on a melee class you know how important that move four is so b max does its job by being good on the top and on the bottom just respectable on the top in the wrong scenarios or wrong situations and very good in the right ones where you get to do kind of a 12 attack and one point of damage to yourself 
that's pretty sweet. So BMAX actually lasted for quite a while in my hand. Ancient Drill is, you know, every one of these classes in Frosthaven's got to have it. You've got to have a class that's got that pierce ability. Here's your pierce ability on this one. And man, does it give a lot of pierce um, if you have that, you know, yellow or red level three or level four um, steam pressure buildup. Also, call back to Ancient Drill. The item in uh, Gloomhaven is just good, classy material. Um, so we appreciate that. The bomb ability here is just funny uh, to me in the concept of like walking over to somewhere and robot like, <laughs> like blowing up a rock and being really angry about that. Um, Ancient Drill is as good as any of these other Pierce cards. It's a totally fine attack. You're taking it into a scenario with you when the monsters have those shields. So that's what you're going to be using it for. Power Core, on the other hand, is a card that's a little stranger than the rest of these because the payoffs here um, are associated with a lost card. You know me, you know I don't like lost cards. A lost card on a nine card class is a really, really, really expensive price to pay. Um, so I'm generally not going to be playing Power Core for its top ability. That being said, if you're at maximum power and you get to target two people with stuns, that is, you know, potentially a scenario winning kind of attack when you're at the end. So that's a really nice ability for you to trigger at the end of a scenario. So the question is, does the bottom of this card work? And absolutely, you don't get to move with this, but it generates some healing three, four, or six. For me, it was almost always four the way that I was playing the game. And, um, bumps up your pressure, which is, as you've noticed, a lot of things really pay off by having your pressure kind of like maximize the top, that yellow or red is like where you're bringing the pain on folks. So this is not to be understated how valuable it is. And also this class doesn't have a lot of healing. So if you don't have the support in the party, but you are up there in that melee bruiser position, um, power core is really important. I took this with me basically forever. Um, it just, it's, Having that bottom heal is, is really, really impactful. And every once in a while, you'll be using that top for a really spicy attack in the right situation. These cards I'm going to kind of refer to as like my heat management cards, I guess is primarily their, their purpose here. Super heat transfer here is kind of funky, right? It's a one attack that puts you up on heat. But if you're at lower levels of heat, level one or two or blue or green, whatever you want to call it, you're going to actually end up going up two heat in total. Um, so this is really for setting up a kind of subsequent attack and you could maybe throw on a wound there. This works nicely in the part of a cycle. I think in a lot of ways, this card is more designed for setting up, you know, for those players who really like to play their certain patterns. I play this, then I play this, then I play this, which you can absolutely do with this class because you're not going to be surprised by how your steam is managed. The monsters aren't going to do anything to mess with it. And if you don't put certain perks in your deck, that's never going to change outside of essentially the cards you play. So super heat transfers for, you know, the players that like want to create those sort of super cycles where they're going down, going back up again, down, going down, going back up again. Um, but, you know, the attack one is just so piddly, even with a wound on it, that uh, it ended up being an ability I didn't use so, so often. Um, on the bottom here, it's a little funny because it's a move two that is actually really only a move one the majority of the time. And what it does is it pushes you to the extreme of where you're at. So if you are in the middle on the green, it pushes you down to blue. And if you are on the yellow, um, it pushes you up to red. Now that's a little weird, um, but this is one of the few cards in the game that uh, allows you to do this. So it sort of takes you from one sort of tier and then pushes you more towards the extreme side of it. So actually for that reason, and it's initiative 25, which is like acceptable. Um, Super Heat Transfer was a card that I actually used the bottom of a decent amount of the time. I'd be at yellow and I'd want to be at red to do a Super B-Max attack or something like that. And you don't have that many bottom cards that let you kind of um, manipulate those amount of things. Now doing that with only moving one space is very difficult. So this is a card that I took with me usually for the first you know, handful of levels and was usually one of the first cards I would lose in a long rest. Um, it did its job, but, you know, it, it just doesn't pack enough kind of wall up to be that impressive, I would say, most of the time. Recursion is a card that I didn't get to play around with a lot, but this is for you combo players out there. Um, and, so, you know, basically it's a normal attack or a normal move. And when you heat up or when you cool down based on whether you did the top or bottom, you do a bunch of that. Um, I feel like in a lot of ways, this card was put in there specifically for one of the masteries, uh, but it allows you to just kind of like set up your more, your, your kind of other attacks. 
you saw the difference in the cards that I think like how how impactful it is to like sort of set up the next attack and you know you could see that for the majority of them like being in double like being in red instead of yellow is going to generate probably one more point of damage maybe an additional ability effect so to me I didn't think that this card was that impressive I didn't play with like kind of a very much like a yo-yo style. So I couldn't really tell you that much about this card. So if someone has really cool experiences with this, I'd love to hear it in the comments. These are kind of the other or weird cards uh, that I found at first level. Steam Armor is your sort of default throw up a shield. Um, and if you're at higher pressure, you throw up more shields, but it does decrease your pressure. Um, that's fine, I guess. Uh, it's not the most exciting. You, I think kind of want to be pairing this with something else but i'm primarily playing this card for the bottom um move two while doesn't not getting you very far hopefully is you're already in melee if you're playing this card and you're just kind of trying to move into a better position maybe with your banner spear friend or something like that 17 initiative is very good and i've already talked before about how much i was trying to jack my pressure up as time went on and so being in the blue or green here and then jacking up your pressure and then making an attack allows you to just kind of keep the steam going so i ended up actually using steam armor for a lot of the a lot of the missions that i was playing in i think in part because of what i was trying to do um but yeah the, the move to increase your heat was was primarily the function that i use this for and then generating fire is you know safer in frost haven against most of your enemies they don't end up using this and you might use it on a couple of your cards as well memory drive is the uh level one card that i think i cut earliest they did try it uh, at least once just to get a sense of it this allows you to pick up cards from your discard pile, but picking up one card from your discard pile as your top action is sort of just like saving half a turn. If you're using a, you know, either of those, you're in, in green or blue steam to pick up two cards, essentially it's a way to sort of like delay a turn, but this doesn't really generate any healing for you. It's sort of, what it does is it generates it delays, right? So you, you're going to play two cards this turn. You're going to pick up two cards from your discard pile. Um, this is, I think, primarily for when you're in a situation where you're using your bottom ability to move or to heal, you know, when you're kind of trying to like cross over um, certain scenarios. But the top of that card just really, it doesn't pack a whole lot of wallop. It just kind of maintains you for when you need to be maintained. And then the bottom here is a move two that can be more move as you go along. You're a nine card class. So um, at the beginning of the scenario, when you, you know, this could be a move five if it's your last move and will be maybe for a little bit um, after that, but it's not going to be too long before this, the absolute ceiling of this card is then a move four and it just decreases from there. And that's only in those specific niche scenarios. So I thought memory drive was not really powerful enough to, to warrant a, a take into the scenarios for me. Processing was a card I admittedly never played, so take my opinion here with a grain of salt. You know how I feel about loots and moves, so move one, loot one is it is what it is. Uh, so we're going to look at the top, which is a little bit weird. Um, this allows you to play three cards on your subsequent turn rather than two cards on your subsequent turn, which is pretty cool. I mean, that's a nice way to set up for going into a room uh, the following turn, right? If you you play this maybe short rest or you just have a bunch of cards in your hand and bust into a room and you, you know, run in with the bottom and then do two top abilities. Maybe one's a shield, maybe one's an attack or something like that. Um, it lets you do some pretty cool stuff in terms of setting up for a subsequent turn. And I do like the idea of that, but when I have only nine cards to choose from and I'm only going to be setting up so often, um, a card that does a very niche amount of movement and a very niche setting up for the next turn is just not where I want to be. I think if one of the sides of this card was uh, a little bit more basically good, just like good in almost any scenario, I'd be more excited about taking it, but I just, I couldn't find myself playing with processing. But, you know, playing three cards in a turn does let you do some really goofy stuff. So um, don't let my ambivalence about it uh, sway you away. Curious Gear was another card I almost never played with. Um, hey, it's it's totally cool to spring traps in the right scenarios. I happened to play through a sequence of scenarios that did not have really that many traps in them. So this card is as good as it is in the specific scenario. If there is a scenario with a number of traps in it, I'd recommend taking it. Springing traps on people is awesome. Um, and you already kind of 
the, the downside is you already kind of have a way with rocket boots of just pushing enemies into traps. So you don't supremely need this, but it is very fast on the initiative. Um, and that bottom ability is hilarious too, you know, using the bottom ability to move an enemy one or two spaces, uh, probably just one space realistically based on where your steam is going to be, is another way of just triggering a trap is most of the time what you're going to be doing with it. Um, but you get to go at 12, so you're really confident you're going to be able to fire this off. So this is a nice X card, like you're not going to be taking it with you most of the time, but every once in a while you can do something goofy with it, and I absolutely respect that choice. To me, level two is when they start telling you why this class is different from other classes. At level one, you're mostly just managing your steam, but this is where they're like, hey, this is kind of like a tank class, but weird. Both of these cards are weird versions of being a tank class. We'll start with release valve, which I did not take. Um, it just hurts people that are next to you, hurts them more if you're running hot, and then you're gonna cool down a whole lot. Bottom ability um, lets you move and then you know, heal and cool down if you're all the way at that maximum pressure there. So if you find yourself pushing up to maximum pressure, um, then you're going to uh, have this card as a way to just kind of outlet all that steam and do these kind of like, you know, respectable other abilities, getting able to just like circumvent enemies' shields and not having to roll to it or roll, draw from your deck to attack them um, is, is pretty nice. But I was really interested in bronze plating. I love me some permanent shields. This isn't really a permanent shield. Um, it's a very, very strange card. You throw up a shield. If you're running like a low heat, low steam, you're going to put a rejuvenate on yourself, which is probably not that helpful because, you know, you're going at 18. So enemies are going to come attack you that turn and probably take that rejuvenate away before you even make use of it. So I find that to be sort of like a superfluous part of this card. Um, and then heat up, which is relevant for when we get to level three. Um, and this card will last for as long as you want it to, uh, but you can't move when you do. So this very much is like setting up your sort of like way station um, combat area. You're now the tower guy. Um, so you rush into a room, ideally moving four or six if you're doing something crazy with rocket boots. Um, get right into the mix of things, throw up your one shield, and then your plan is to sit there and pummel your enemies for the next few turns. Ideally, you do this in such a way that bronze plating is at the beginning of your you know, card play cycle. Uh, and then by the time you go to short or long rest, you put the bronze plating down, move somewhere else, and then you take your short or long rest um, along the way. This is gonna, you know, sort of, it's a, basically like a shield that you're gonna last, have last for like two, maybe three turns is, is sort of the idea um, with this card. And I think in a lot of ways is, is the ideal way to play it. Fun to use, really interesting. Uh, but, you know, obviously it's it's niche. I think I tried a little bit too hard to make this card work. I don't really know why I was in love with the idea so much. Um, but generating that extra um, steam is nice. And the bottom of this card helps you generate that additional steam and makes you and your allies just punch a little bit more. It's really, frankly, only an okay card. I did have a fun time playing it. And I used it all the time, uh, which is going to make more sense when we hop over to level three. We're gonna talk about Stress Fence, which is the card that made me wanna play this class. I'm gonna read the text to you. Whenever you are attacked by an enemy within two spaces, you may downgrade your steam to cause the attacker to suffer three damage immediately after this attack. Discard this card if you're ever at the blue level and then immediately jack yourself up. I was talking so much along the way about how I had a lot of steam. This is why I love a prickle build. Um, so I basically had myself set up where I would run into a room, throw up that shield, have all the enemies attacking me, and then as often as I wanted to, you know, essentially paying my steam down to do an automatic three retaliate points damage to folks um, along the way. Whether they were in melee or not, the range two thing is, is actually extremely respectable here. I actually think that that card that I just talked about at level two bronze, bronze armor, bronze plating, um, is really only playable with Stress Vent's ability to like hit people at two away. It actually makes quite a big difference, I would say. This card was so much fun for me. The fact that you are allowed to choose whether you're going to do the Retaliate 3 damage or not comes up more often than you would think. Whether you needed them to take 3 damage, whether 3 damage was important, um, based on you know what other attacks were happening that turn, whether you wanted this card to go off or not. But I loved setting up Stress Vents early on in my cycle. 
um, really easy to put this up, right? Because it's at an initiative 15 and uh, then just sort of like carrying it through. Now, the tough thing about this class is I did mention it's a nine card class. As time goes on, this card gets less and less impactful as you're gonna have shorter and shorter cycles and you don't necessarily wanna keep this from one cycle to another. Um, this is a class that really, I think, challenges you to think, do I have an even or odd number of cards because I wanna be lasting through this scenario? Am I gonna leave this in play or am I gonna put this in my discard pile on the rest reshuffle? That's, I think, the hardest part about playing this class strategically. Um, because you could alternatively just kind of throw it in and then use the bottom of this card as a weaker version of that kind of prickle build, right? Move a little bit and throw up some retaliate along the way. I pretty much never used the bottom of this card because I was almost always using the top. That's what the build was entirely based off of. Uh, but I think the bottom is a respectable bottom. I will say that this is a hard choice though, because level three is pretty cool. Electrical Discharge is a really nice attack. Hitting someone for two stun, stuns are really hard to come by in Frost Haven. Um, and sometimes you can wall up them for some extra damage, but frankly, it's mostly about the two stun, I think. And then it puts your um, steam down. I think that if you're playing a build that wants your steam to be lower for one reason or another, then Electrical Discharge is an easy choice because the base ability there is nice. But frankly, I'm not playing the top of this card most of the time. I think I really want to be playing this card for the bottom. A move four stun someone next to you is a really, really powerful ability. Now, it does come with the pretty significant downside of stunning yourself. Basically, the bottom of this card is only playable, I think, in two circumstances. One, you are already at that bottom level, that blue level of zero, like level one steam or whatever you want to call it, and the downside does not affect you. Or two, you're planning on long resting next turn. This is a long rest class because you're one of those classes that takes all the things with the armors and the, you know, the negative one things and you want to be restoring those. So you're going to be long resting a fair amount. Your allies, you know, they've got 10, 11, 12 card hands. And so you want to be rolling a little bit more slowly than the rest of your friends are going to be. So I just... Um, I think that Electrical Discharge can be a really cool card. I love both of these level three cards. I will also say that they are kind of at odds with one another. This is not the kind of card that you would go back and pick up at a higher level uh, because they both compete for downward pressure on your steam. I took energy conversion, but magnetic field is the winner for thematic cards so far. Um, I like the other stuff and the uniqueness of this class, but the idea of magnetic field is hilarious to me. An attack that soaks up the treasure from around you as gold coins just thunk, 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 stick to you is really, really funny to me. This is what I was talking about with those low, um, those low steam builds, right? Like if you have a way to heal five yourself, right? If you like had an ice and you're at the bottom level there of, of uh, your steam, like that is a lot of, that's a lot of lines on one card. If you can make magnetic field work for you, the upside of it is just absolutely huge. The bottom of this card is entirely respectable too. And I actually almost took the bottom of this card for the build that I was playing because um, when you have bronze plating and you're not able to move, sucking everybody two spaces closer to you, including your allies, I think, by the way, um, just makes for a very funny situation, right? The whole room just comes like screeching closer towards you. I think the number of times you're at high steam and you actually get to get that one shield are probably not too high. But one thing that's worth noting is that if you are at that high level of steam, this actually doesn't depress your high level of steam. And that is really cool because there's not a lot of abilities that get you that benefit and then don't subsequently bring you down. So if you're able to set that up, magnetic field, you're noticing that I'm saying like, I think this card has a really high upside, but requires you to be very good at managing your steam. On the other hand, I said, you know what? I'm playing four-handed. I'm going to focus on what's just a little bit more straightforward. I'm going to play energy conversion. Energy conversion is the kind of loss card in the top that's just very easy to use. I want to wall for someone for a bazillion damage. Maybe I'll do a little bit less so I can modify my steam. Hooray. This is the kind of loss I want if the bottom is playable. And hey, you know what? The bottom is playable. Um, moving one, not great. Moving three, fine, sure. But I play this card because it's a move one and then whenever you attack this round, up your steam. Very, very obviously, I think this card is designed as a combo with stress vents because basically you're saying, oh, you're gonna attack me? I'll drop down and you know, you're know you gonna take three damage and I've been attacked, so I'm gonna move back up. And you basically get to go infinite with your 
uh, build that you already kind of structured here and then later on in the scenario get to just drop a huge wallop. I think that if you are like me and you went for the the prickle build, the uh, uh, it's not electrical discharge, the stress fence build, then energy conversion is is the obvious choice um, to pair with that. But magnetic field is really exciting. This, this card, just, this class just has some really fun looking cards. It's too bad that we can only play nine of them. Looking at these cards and evaluating um, them, I'm sure you can guess that I took heat conduction to kind of continue on this like weird stand in the middle of a room pummel me combo. So let's talk about this guy first. Um, just puts up tons more uh, uh, retaliate or shields if you're set up in the right way. The thing is, if you're not at maximum or minimum uh, steam, this card's like pretty lame, right? Just like a one shield on like an 11 is like really not worth it. The bottom, however, is pretty cool. When an ally ends their movability next to you, you can heat up to heal yourself. Um, and if you get all the way to the top, then that's going to go down. If you have heat conduction up at the same time as stress vents and your allies are working in tandem with you, which, you know, when you're playing solo four-handed, they always are, um, you can do some goofy stuff with just constantly moving your steam up and down. Everybody's attacking you and you can just manage that constantly. Just everybody in the room taking three damage as they keep attacking you. You just keep healing yourself. So again, the ability to just kind of like cycle this on and on and on and on um, is really nice. And it's a bottom ability. You can play this at the same time as playing one of those other abilities that you use to set up. So heat conduction was fun. It did work for that. It wasn't um, as smooth as as I would have thought because enemies tend to go in clusters, right? Because of the way initiative works in Frosthaven. So it wasn't as much like go up one, go down one, go up one, go down one. Really easy to manage as I thought. I still had to make choices about what enemies would or wouldn't take damage. But this was a nice way to kind of get some healing in there, put my steam back all the way, you know, kind of, or even just like up, even just one space was like well worth it every time. Um, when an ally sets up and if you're playing with banner spear they love standing their turn next to you so um, that worked out really well too radiation on the other hand is just a very solid attack right like a five damage poison attack is is yeah i mean like it's nothing insane but it does its work and also you can make it an attack four to have some flexibility um or no not you don't get to make an attack four you must make an attack four and then push yourself to an extreme um, side if you're not already on kind of the extreme sides which is we see we generally want to be in the red or the blue so I think that you know downside comes with the upside that sort of balances it out um the bottom here is a little funny I I didn't get to play radiation but I thought about it for a long time because this idea that you move and you set up for like when you are going to do an attack that does one or two damage to you and you do it to the enemy instead it's a nice little perk uh but i'm i was trying to think of why i would be playing the bottom of this card rather than the pretty good attack on the top of this card and i think it's gonna be pretty niche it's fun to to pull off but i think it's not good enough that you're going to be playing it all that often compared to playing the top of this card so um, top of radiation bottom of heat conduction that's generally what i'm looking at uh, when i'm considering my level fives Level six for me was Scalding Blast. It's just a pretty respectable attack that uh, can turn into just an absolutely dirty attack in the right scenarios. But, you know, attack six or attack five, two people with one damage to yourself, it, that hurts. Um, even the bottom of this card in attack three with Pierce two, you don't see Pierce at the bottom very often. That jacks up that heat that I'm always trying to, to get up there. Um, does a nice solid amount of work. On the other hand, I really enjoy the the design of Steam Core. So Steam Core lets you heal yourself for five, which is pretty good. I mean, it's um, at this stage, yeah, it's a good number of healing to give yourself. Uh, but then it sort of expects you to be either surrounded by enemies or surrounded by allies, and hopefully you are at the you know Steam level to get that little extra perk there. Like I said, I think it's hard to end your turns, you know, at these top levels, but I'm of course very biased from playing a version of this class where I am constantly, you know, paying my steam to, to punish my enemies for, for coming next to me. But I love the design of Steam Core because the bottom of this card is a callback to our friend from level one, the Steel Piston, um, where instead it's a, a moving that lets you kind of hyper move along the way. Um, that being said, at level six, a move three that kind of is a move five, but sort of a slow move five at initiative 71 really is not that exciting. Um, and this is the first level in a few levels where I think these cards are both like solid, but uh, 
they're not going to completely change the way you're going to play this class one way or another. Um, you know whether, you know, you've been in the scenarios. Do you need some more healing or do you want to pummel people some more? Whichever one sounds more appealing to you, I think is going to determine which card you're going to take. The level seven cards are where I'm getting into speculation land uh, because I didn't play at these levels. But these cards are goofy. Um, we'll start with Heated Drill. So Heated Drill is just a you know, attack that's maybe a bigger attack with fire, that's maybe a bigger pierce attack if you've got essentially the right amount of heat. It's just kind of like an improved version of Ancient Drill, um, which is appropriate for level seven. I don't think necessarily that exciting, but it's a solid card, no no disrespect there. I think the bottom of this card is maybe a little bit more interesting, um, you know, an attack three with pierce on it, but we just had an attack with pierce in the bottom at level six, so it's a little redundant if you did choose the the scalding blast or whatever it was um and you possibly have a bunch of move here but i don't i i'm not so impressed by heated drill that i think that many folks are going to be taking it i think instead a lot of folks are going to instead be taking cryogenic hibernation we're going to go to the top last because the bottom is just more fundamental um the bottom here is a nice little move card it looks like a move two which you're like Ugh, move two again but like i said you're going to spend a lot of time in the middle of your um the middle of your energy here so being able to move three or move four and jump up your heat um, gives you a little bit of flexibility if you are at the bottom and you do have an ice there you get to do some other goofy stuff with that along the way by brittling an enemy brittling an enemy right before you punch them for an attack five or something like that uh is is pretty gnarly i mean there's that that's a that's a nice little combo there so i think you're probably taking cryogenic and probably playing the bottom of that card most often at level seven. Let's look at the top of this card because it is just goofy beyond all belief. Um, shield two that sticks around until you don't want to be using it anymore is something that definitely warrants your attention. But the designers of the game also understood that and they said, well, okay, when you have this, you can't attack, which, you know, to be fair, if you're playing the retaliate build, like, I wasn't really attacking. Maybe at the previous level, you also took the thing that's like heal five. You could take that and have that not perform attack abilities thing essentially not be a detriment based on the build that you're playing with this class. There is the punching version of this class, but it's pretty easy to build it in such a way that you're not even punching. You're just punishing enemies for attacking you and you keep on going. However, at the end of each of your turns, giving yourself a brutal is really bad. I mean, brittle is not that nasty when you have two shields up and maybe you've got three or four shields up based on other kinds of builds or other options that you've had um, along the way there. So that's that's a really, it's bad to, ta to like constantly be brittling yourself. Uh, but I guess if there's a scenario where it's not going to be as bad, it's the one where you've got a lot of shields. This card's going to be most powerful when you're being attacked by a lot of dinky enemies. But I think that when you are playing Frosthaven, I didn't feel like there were that many scenarios where a lot of dinky enemies were attacking me. There's not as many like sewers with a bunch of snakes that are attacking me um, that there were kind of like in the original Gloomhaven series. So I think this is going to be a little bit more scenario dependent on how powerful it's going to be. But let me know in the comments if it worked for you more more default wise obviously tacking on four additional healing on there if you're at the right um, level of energy really helps but yeah level seven a little funny level eight makes up for level six and seven as far as i'm concerned though uh, we're gonna start on the left with curious machinery having an enemy do an attack and a stun on it is that's i mean who, i don't know that it really matters that it's the enemy making the attack i actually think it's probably a disadvantage rather than you making the attack um, because you need to have two enemies in order to make this work and they need to be next to each other in such a way so there's a limitation on that certainly um, on the other hand if you are at maximum capacity and you just get like a three attack double stun um, that's pretty cool it's just it's you know it's work that you need to do to to make that happen there is setup that needs to be required but you're at initiative 11 so you can really stymie an enemy and your friends can just pummel them to death uh it's absolutely worth it just to just just for those abilities alone. The bottom of this card, um, letting you basically run over a trap and instead of taking the damage, healing yourself is a very unique, goofy ability uh, and is is just super good. There's going to be you know enough scenarios along the way where there's traps and sometimes those traps are directly in your way and you need to run into them. Or sometimes in the case of this, you could just run into them at your will. Um, to, to trigger them as as healing by the time you're level eight these traps like hit for a lot of damage based on what your 
your allies uh, are, are looking like here. And the fact that you can optionally, with the right elements, go ricocheting into the top or bottom tier of, um, of your Steam levels. I think that the bottom of Curious Machinery is is really appealing to me. So I'm 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 definitely vibing that card. Piston Barrage though is just a lot of fun. I mean, when we see a four attack, three attack, three attack on the top of a card, like that's a lot of punching that you get to do. Um, so we love this sort of tsh, tsh, very like anime neck style. Um, but even the bottom of this card is pretty cool, like moving and two damage to to enemies in a circle around you. Yeah, at level eight, that's not the most exciting thing in the world, but I think this is a step up over some of your other move cards. So uh, I don't think you can really go wrong either way, but I'd, I'd probably be leaning towards Curious Machinery just because of the goofiness of it. This is the goofy stuff I've been looking for for level nine cards. Love these cards, a lot of fun. Unstable Core is absolutely hilarious. The top of this card is the epitome of a loss card, right? You, <laughs> you play four cards, doing them however you want to, right? Any pressure effect, just play these four cards as best possible and you're done for the scenario. This is the way to go out with a bang every single time. It does crack me up. They're like, well, you can't pick up this card from the discard pile um, just as a way to like, I don't know, like punish you for having discarded or something. Like I just, I think that's hilarious. But um, the top of that is like the ultimate lost card as far as I'm concerned uh and I, I love that they put that on here the bottom of this card is really interesting sticks around for a while and lets you manage your pressure in such a way to get extra punches or extra moves um the problem is that if you get all the way to the maximum or the minimum pressure you're going to take five damage and discard this card so frankly you're going to be taking unstable core probably when you're playing not the build i'm talking about when you're playing a little bit more of a fundamental melee build um, where you're sort of like moving up and down and your goal is to basically just bounce between those green and yellow levels as much as possible um, which i think is very viable if you just sort of took like a lot of the more like basic punch in the face, punch in the face, punch in the face, punch in the face cards. And so then you get rewarded by taking this unstable core that can be pretty exciting for a little while. And then you can just go absolutely nuclear as the scenario is about to end. Um, love that card. Wouldn't work with the build that I was talking about. Fortunately, polarity shift is also just patently hilarious. You need the right elements for it to really work. Um, and I don't know that I've seen a card that like consumes an element and then like makes the elements in the way that this one does is a little bit funny in that way. You could play this card and then um, use like a stamina potion to play this card again next turn. But pulling everybody into you, maybe doing some damage, pushing them away, thematically hilarious. Power level, I think not that good, frankly. Getting a bunch of people close to you is great. Pushing them away is great. You can do a lot of funny stuff with like how the, the scenario is set up and where the different enemies are and if there's traps and things like that. But this doesn't do a whole lot of damage. Um, and also it says all, which I think includes your allies. So I, I don't know that the top of this card is really that good. Um, you can do some goofy stuff. And I think you might be able to once in a blue moon save this scenario for it. Um, and you look at the bottom of this card and you're like, wow, look at all this bananas text out there. And it is bananas text, but turns out it's really just four different totally fine and respectable abilities that do goofy stuff with your um with your with your steam levels uh so probably polarity shift is being used for its bottom more than anything else like attack five on the bottom move five on the bottom shield two heal six all those are extremely respectable i think you're not going to be using this for the top all that often though um, but if you can i would take that unstable core that's just hilarious like you you've got it if you can uh just wouldn't work for my build Let's talk masteries. Um, I didn't try to complete either of them doing the solo forehanded thing. Both of these masteries are a little bit more of the puzzle masteries. You really got to play a sort of d disciplined kind of way. I think if there was one that I was going to go for with my build, it's the never attack one. Super viable with that prickle build. I think that you have the ability to just kind of like punish people constantly. And there's enough other things that you can be doing with your top actions that that mastery is actually pretty easy to get. And also is something that you could get... Um, without really uh, not doing your job. Like if your build is this way, you could set that up. If you get to level seven, you've got that cryogenic one that makes you not attack, then it just forces you to follow these rules even better still. The bottom of this one is one of those like puzzle ones. There's a lot of these in this where it's like, you could set up 
with the right cards, you pull them out. This goes all the way up. This goes all the way down. You know, that recursion, that like X thing at level one. I don't know what level you quite have to be, like what cards you would need to make it so that you go all the way to the bottom and all the way to the top of the pressure gauge. Um, maybe someone in the comments below has has already solved this, but um, I'm, I'm personally not a huge fan of these masteries because they basically just require you to play in a scenario where you say, yep, my first four turns are going to look exactly like this and I'm going to go whoop, 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 and then I'll have completed it if I have the right things. Um, but you probably need to be a higher level do it to do it. My guess is that you need certain cards to make it happen. Your mileage may vary. Um, in terms of perks here, I uh, will say right off the bat with the build that I made, it, they don't matter as much because you're not attacking as often. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit more generally rather than for my specific build because for me, it didn't matter all that much, to be honest with you. Um, I think being able to manage your steam is just always good in this game. So can't go wrong with this. It's a mild improvement on your deck and a nice little perk for your specific class. So I just think these are fun to take. I like rolling modifiers and getting shields are nice on this class. You're always in the mix, even if you're not a prickle build like I was. Like you still are just going to be getting punched a lot. This card I thought was kind of mediocre. It's kind of it's almost like turning a zero into a plus one, right? Because you're just, you're doing that additional damage to that enemy. But the fact that it also does the damage to the enemies adjacent to it, I actually thought was, was cooler than I thought it was going to be. I took it just to kind of like test it out. And the couple of times that I pulled it, I almost always did two points of damage with this, which I thought was pretty cool. So um, I wouldn't sleep on this one as much as, as you wanted. I also took this one for the same kind of curiosity reasons. It was as mediocre as you would think rolling like niche rolling modifiers would be um i talked in a previous video about the difficulty of these ones where you heal yourself because yes you get pummeled a lot and you probably are going to benefit from this heal but it just feels really bad when you don't get those additional heals so this is really low on my priority list um Lava plus three, they're just the, the random variance of hitting someone for a, almost a crit or maybe even better than a crit, depending on how you're attacking them, is well worth putting it. This is, for me, a, an auto pickup on any tank build that I'm, I'm playing. This one is even further rewarded, ignoring those negative one effects and making your attack modifier deck better. This is a first pickup as far as I'm concerned. You do long rest a lot with this class, and so I think that this is an okay ability. Um, in fact, in retrospect, I maybe would choose this for the build that I did because, like I said, I didn't care about my attack modifier deck quite as much. So you should maybe consider this <clears throat> if you're going to go with that kind of defensive retaliation build um, along the way. I took this, and it almost never came in handy. And you know what? I don't frankly regret it because taking poison is really, really nasty on a melee class. It's especially nasty on a melee class that does not have many options to heal itself uh, because you're sort of at the whim of your allies, and you're really focused on your shields doing a lot of your work as this class or just killing people straight out and so those extra one points of damage they can really add up so um, i do think that this is worth picking up if you are going to be in the mix a lot you don't have people that have those incidental one heals um, to help you out along the way and then everyone's got to know about this ridiculous one this is absolutely hilarious three is a lot of perks to give up i am need to be convinced that it's the most amazing ever and i sat and i thought about thought about this one for a while and i think it just isn't quite good enough so it's when you become exhausted you basically shut down and you're gonna pick up four cards and discard them so you're gonna become exhausted you're gonna unbecome exhausted but probably still be at very low hit points because you're probably becoming exhausted because you're at low hit points. And then the subsequent turn, you're going to long rest. And I think most of the time, then you're going to get beat the snot out of on the next turn and then just die or like lose two of the cards from the discard pile to prevent from dying. That makes this not work a lot. But I guess if your allies are really good about getting in the mix after you go down, then you do have the opportunity in that long rest to heal a little bit pick up three cards and picking up those three cards will essentially give you two additional actions that you can take before the end of the scenario. I think that that like skip a turn and maybe have two actions. If nothing bad happens to you, there are too many ifs in there for it to be worth three 
perk check marks for me. But that being said, again, with the prickle build where I didn't really care about this attack modifier deck as much, this wouldn't actually be so terrible. I think on most classes, I would not waste. <laughs> I would not use the, the three um, perks, but actually if you are just kind of going to be like a come at me and let me do goofy stuff kind of build you could try it let me know if it works for you but i think most of the time it's just going to be you being around to take an extra hit or two for your allies maybe you get to take another action in the ideal world you take two more actions it just seems like a lot of work to get there i'm not convinced but i'd love to be convinced let me know in the comments hey Thanks for watching this video, everybody. Hope you enjoyed my take on the drill class. I thought it was a really fun, different kind of take on the um, melee tank build. And you can just play this as just a straight up nice punching class. But I think building it as the sort of weird retaliation class was what really drew me to the class. And I'd encourage you to give it a shot if you like playing something with a little bit of a goofier management style. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video and we'll be back for the fourth one not too long from now. Bye everyone.